welcome back to Reclaim You. Laura is here today, and we're diving back into eating disorder and body image stuff. Good to be here today. How are things? You know, we're just keeping going on, right? I, mm -hmm. I've, I've shared with some of my clients. They know, like, I, I have um, a wedding coming up for me, and we could do a whole episode around events and how we that brings could. up stuff with body image and, eat, you know, eating and things like that. So, um, but it's a good opportunity to practice the things that I've learned along the way. Yep. Back to those basics. Like we talked about, I don't know, however many episodes ago, but yeah. I can't keep track. <laughs> yeah. 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 That'd be a great episode to talk about, especially, you know, weddings, weddings bring up so much stuff. And even I think the theme of today's podcast control, like the idea of control and the desire to control outcomes or a look or whatever it is yeah. in weddings. Yeah. yeah, we could definitely talk about that. We could do a lot with that for sure. Wow. Yeah. What does it mean to want to control? And are you really wanting to control the thing that you're trying to control or is this about something else? Yeah. That's the question. That's the question. Yeah. And I had, I had thought about this topic for a uh, conversation because I, I kept seeing over and over again, this idea that you know, when asked what, like, what's, what are eating disorders about? Like, what are at the root of eating disorders? And the response I kept seeing over and over again, and even on, on Instagram, we talk about control all the time, that eating mm -hmm. disorders are like a method of control, 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 control. And I was kind of like, okay, like enough about the control, <laughs> enough about the control. Let's just like peel it back a little bit and control maybe, sure, some of the time. I don't know. But what mm -hmm. else? What else is it with eating disorders and body image stuff that make people think that it's all about control? So that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So where should we start? Well, I mean, like, let's, let's just start with, with, you know, the, what is out there, right? And, and this comes up and I mean, there's some truth to it. This idea that, you know, when we begin to focus on eating and controlling our eating and being very... Um, hyper focused on that, that in a way, like we are trying to gain control in some way, shape or form. But again, is it about that control? I think it's more about where do I feel out of control in my life? Or where have I had experiences that have led me to eat in such a way? I mean, I might not even be aware that this is a problem, right? Yeah. Um, if we think about our families of origin, right, and the ways that we were taught to eat, um, not everyone is taught to eat in the same way. Intuitive eating is not something that is, you know, easily taught. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, I, I think a lot of families, you know, people would tell you, oh, uh, what is that? Like, like we just ate at the appointed times, right? Um, we just showed up and we ate. Yeah. 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 So I think that like, there's like, there's so many factors to be considered. Certainly your experiences with availability of food, accessibility to food, the types of food that you, you were able to access. So there's a lot there. Definitely. And even I would imagine that some people growing up had felt, have felt maybe controlled by their parents, caregivers, whoever it is, in terms of like, you have to finish your plate before you get yeah. dessert or before you get up from the table or whatever, whatever it is, whatever the narrative was. And again, mm -hmm. Placing that back on them, have feeling like you have no agency, right? You have no agency or autonomy or ability to make decisions, mm -hmm. you know, with your food. And so you learn to behave in certain ways. Yeah. And in a way, it's the behavior or those responses to those experiences that really is in control. You're not in control. Like, right? Like, if we want to think about it that way, does that make sense? And so the real work for recovery is getting beneath the surface of what's really behind all of this. What's at the root of this? What is leading us to engage with food, with body in these ways? And, you know, then how do we, how do we tend to that? And even the idea of control and thinking from the nervous system perspective to the idea of control and just the hypervigilance around that. And if we think of it in a survival response, like maybe some like fight energy or maybe even some like flight energy to like, get away from something or either one of yep. those can be tracked with hypervigilance. So, you know, looking at flipping it on its head a little bit of looking at, okay, so there's hypervigilance. So there's maybe some fight, maybe some flight going on. Like, what mm -hmm. is it that's, you know, 
that's causing that, that's, you know, triggering that reaction internally. And I don't think it's like, oh, I have no control. Maybe it's, I don't feel safe, right? Or exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's a trauma response, right? Like in a way, you know, that hypervigilance, that fight or flight, I mean, we're responding to some sort of trauma, some sort of something that's happened. And maybe I don't have agency. Maybe I don't have power in a situation, but also maybe there are all of these horrible feelings or experiences that I've had that I can't sit with because it's too much. And so food becomes a way to disconnect from that. Mm -hmm. Right, to mask, to to focus elsewhere instead of looking at what's really at the heart of my struggle. Absolutely. I mean, I think about for myself, my last kind of iteration of eating disorder behaviors. And on the surface, I likely would have said, oh yeah, like turning towards movement and turning towards food was a mechanism of control. You know, maybe back then I would have said that because I was in a really toxic work environment and things just didn't mm -hmm. feel great. When really, I think what it was, was that that offered those behaviors, that structure, the rigidity offered some containment that felt much more safe than all the shit that was coming in elsewhere. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And if we think about it that way, like containment, there is a steadiness about it, a stability, right? Like if I'm involved in engaging in habits day in and day out, I know what it is I'm going to do. Like if I know the this is how I eat. This is the exact meal. You know, people have very specific uh, routines and wow. and engage with food in those ways and exercise too. You're right. Like it does create that sense of stability that might be lacking elsewhere. Like a sense of like, okay, this is a place where I feel like I know what is coming. I know how to manage this, how to tolerate this. And and that other stuff can't get in here. Yeah, which like reduces some of the hypervigilance, right? Like mm -hmm. if you feel contained. And, you know, to an end, at some point, I'm sure it doesn't feel as containing as it does, maybe painful or else no one would ever recover. Right. But, you know, that that safety of knowing that, like, OK, th this is OK. I'm OK here. I am OK, which may or may not have anything to do with control. Uh huh. Totally. Yeah. I mean, this is I mean, like the, the heart of this is like we feel unsafe in our bodies. We don't trust ourselves with food in our bodies. Like, like everything, there's this complete uprooting upheaval. And for some of us, those roots were never in place in the first place, right? So it's like we, that is a vulnerable feeling to be just, you know, floating around. And then like you are subjected to a world of diet culture constantly. Maybe, yeah, you're subjected to family members who like to make comments or who are trying to tell you like, in the almond mom, you know, world, like that you have to eat this way, particularly and not this way. And so all of that stuff, I, there's so many, so many factors at play. Yeah. That to say, okay, well, let's just take control back in other parts of your life. And then you're good is really not at all getting at recovery. Absolutely. It's like different ripples of the same. I don't know, mm -hmm. rock on. That's not an analogy, but I made it up. So you know what I mean? <laughs> I get it. Well, and it's a false, it's it's just a false belief, right? Because like the reality is, is that when we are recovering, you know, from in, in any way, shape or form, it really isn't about, it's about building up tolerance, mm -hmm. right? It's about resourcing myself with those things that I need to to manage whatever might come at me. It's about being able to live in uncertainty in a more grounded way and to feel that I can create some safety in that certainty for myself, right? Mm -hmm. And in eating disorder recovery, that I can create that safety in a way that's different from controlling food or controlling exercise or what have you. You know, control gives the sense that like, once I have full control that I know what's coming when and blah, 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 blah. Well, that's, you know, that's hypervigilance. That's not right. yeah. just like you said, right? And and it's false. It's a false sense of security to think that you would have any control over what's coming down the pike. And none of us does. We don't know right. on any given day what it might come. And that's not to make us all like, well, anxious all the time. Right. But right. it's like, to well, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those of us who've had opportunities to sort of like, 
um, be exposed to that, to learn how to negotiate that, manage that, like regulate our emotions around that, whether it's through recovery work, whether it's just, we had good role models growing up, it's less of an issue, right? Like we kind of roll with it. Whereas there's others of us who, you know, we've never had that opportunity. We didn't have good role models. People in our families didn't deal with emotions or they freaked out in like big ways. And there was all this dysregulation. And so that we need to, recovery is about learning and, and, and the safe space becomes the space with the therapist, right? Or wow. with your other providers that becomes the container and the safe space that takes place of those in, uh, behaviors you might have been engaging in before. And it's just, it's just making me think about a question that we got on Instagram that someone had asked that we answered. So the question on Instagram was how to find the boundary between external control being helpful versus harmful. For example, meal plans. So, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, imagining that this person may be working with, with a team, maybe a dietitian or, you know, a therapist, who knows, but, you know, how it can feel like exerting control when you have a meal plan. And I wonder, is it control? Does it make you help you feel contained? You know, how is it serving you? Right? Like on the surface? Yes, like it feels more in control. But when you get underneath that, like, what does that sense of control? How does it land inside of you? What does it help? What does it make you make meaning about you by following this meal plan? That makes sense. Yeah, I have issues with meal plans in general, right? Because I think, like, as an intuitive eating person, they can become problematic. They also set a bar, a standard that we, if we're not meeting it because we're in recovery and we're human beings, feel shitty and it can like lead us back into a spiral of shame. Sometimes we need some structure, certainly, especially like you know those those folks who are coming in and really need to be refed in a lot of ways, like. They need to just get enough into their bodies and but like i'll hear clients say to me about meal plans like because they'll you know like folks will talk about like well i don't understand why this intuitive eating dietitian is not telling me what i need to be eating they're not giving me the meal plan and that's not about control it's about for them it's like i need to be held accountable mm -hmm. like i need something that i can be held accountable to because you know otherwise i don't know what to do and then i can't trust myself mm -hmm. right and so it's sort of like, I mean, I get how that can get a control, right? But it, but it really is at the heart of it. What are you learning if you're just following this rubric? Mm -hmm. Like you're just learning. That's all externalized. That's not internally you. If you're just following a meal plan internally, what are you learning about tolerance when fear foods come up? What are you learning about listening to your hunger cues and responding to them? What are you learning about those fullness cues? What are you learning about your likes and dislikes, your preferences for food? Like, where can any of that work take place if you're just following this map? Definitely. And I think there's, especially for folks who may be having a relapse in their eating disorder or new to recovery or just, you know, struggling, maybe it's a season of struggle, that I'm coming back to the idea of containment, the containment of having some structure to lean on when everything else feels like a free fall, feels so much different than grasping for this idea of control through rigidity of a meal plan. Yeah, yeah. which that flexibility, I think, helps us lean into what our bodies are telling us, how we can trust ourselves, you know, yes. how we can stay fed enough to understand the nuances of our hungers mm -hmm. and our cravings and things like that. Yeah, and we can create structure that's flexible, right? Which I think is what you're getting at, right? Like, so, so for instance, some of our clients are on medications that might limit their ability to really listen to their hunger and to respond to it. And generally speaking, those are medications we would work with folks to say, do you really need this? But if it's something they need and it's been determined, then we might need to create some structure around, okay, if you are going to be more disconnected from that hunger cue, how do we create some structure in your day where you can check in and really listen and where you can make sure like, oh, I haven't been hungry for like several hours now, but I, my body still needs food. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm thinking about like ADHD meds where some people in order yeah. to function, like they absolutely need them, but there's this side effect. And so that can mess up, you know, some of our sense of like intuiting what our body needs. So we need to create some structure, like in the beginning, let's set alarms every this many hours and let's just check in and like really start to listen. And can I even like sense, or do I need to eat 
you know, I need to make sure these are the hours of the day that I'm, I'm getting food into me, Mm -hmm. you know, or I know that like during the day when my medicine is taking more effect, I might eat less, but that at night I'm going to eat more. And that doesn't mean it's a binge. It's just you following the lead of your body. Right. And the structure, the structure, the containment of whatever that is, is supporting you to do that. Right. Yeah. Whatever structure you and your providing team, you know, come up with that works for you. And that's, we have to be flexible around that too, because it doesn't, the same structure, the same ways of being and doing don't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. But a a surefire way that maybe you're being invited to think differently is when you're, you're getting really frustrated because you're not being told what you need to be eating you're not being given a meal plan and go out seeking someone else who's going to work with you to just, you know, or exchanges or any of that stuff that we see in programs. So what I would be curious about if that came up in session is, oh, interesting. So like, let's talk a little bit more about this frustration that you're having. Like, Mm -hmm. what is this really about? I feel out of control. I like, there's all this stuff. It's not contained. Like I need something to help me contain it. And this makes the most sense, but that's not the answer. Back to that containment and safety. You know, what I'm reading between the lines there is like, I don't feel safe doing this without the structure, the rigidity, right? And and again, that's part of, of recovery is learning to regulate and ride the waves of like feeling like you need to do something, you need to fix, you need more information, all of those things and coming back to number one, communicating your needs and getting really curious about, you know, how this is landing and, yeah. you know, working with your, your support team around that. Finding other options to really get at like, what are, what are the real needs here? And are there various options available to me? Can I start to explore and be curious about, hmm, maybe if I try this, how would that be? Can I step into some discomfort knowing that I have like the support of my team? And, and that this is a gradual process of recovery. Like, it's not like, you know, some of my clients, you know, are like, oh my gosh, you're going to tell me how to do this, that, that, that. like, no, 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 right? Like process, right? Like your relationship with food in your body is your relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm here to help you expand what your experience has been to be curious about what else might be there to, to flexibly allow yourself to try some new ways of being and doing and to give you support around that. Because inevitably, yes, if you're trying something for the first time after years of of having this container of control, if you will, yeah. like it's not going to be easy at first. Right. 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 A meal plan is just a substitute for the old way of containment. It's the same thing, just with a different name versus looking at more um, flexible aspects of, of what it means to be in recovery, you know, allowing oneself to, there are times I'm going to eat more than others and that's going to be really uncomfortable, but that doesn't mean that I have to now come back to the restrictive mindset and behaviors, right? Like I can live and tolerate this space and eventually trust. One of the things I remember with my dietitian, and I know this comes up for a lot of my clients is she was like, no, that fear food that you have, I want it in, I want like you to have a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Right. When does this stop? When do you tell me what I actually should be eating? Yeah. And until I realized that that wasn't the end goal, I had to live with all of that discomfort and I had to move through it, but I learned to tolerate it. And then eventually I was like, whoa, you know, those cookies that I used to not even be able to keep the box in the cabinet for more than a couple of days, if that, Mm -hmm. even then there for like a month and I forgot about them because I'm allowed to access them whenever I want. There's this freedom from control, this freedom from rigidity in which we learn to find security and safety, but that takes time and practice and support. And I think if you're someone who is following a meal plan, to use it as a way to step into some, you know, expansion, you know, mm-hmm. to use it to uphold you in your recovery. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. And to use it to, to push when you're ready to push, growing through some of those edges of the meal plan or growing with the meal plan, whatever, however that might look for you. Because that way you can, you know, start to experiment with what makes you feel super uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, what makes you feel like you're losing control? And if we re- replace control with like, okay, if it wasn't about control, what would it be? And, you know, I would venture to say like a lack of trust in yourself, you know, a lack of safety, a lack of containment, all of those things that we've talked about, Mm -hmm. you know, how can you start to address those more underlying issues while also being upheld by what you have in the here and now? You know, there's 
so many ways to to come at that, but it feels important to use it as something, as a as a starting point and to grow with it outside of it, you know, to learn how to feel dysregulated when something gets added or shifted yeah. or whatever it is and learn how to cope with that because that's what probably normal eating is going to look like at some point. Yeah, and, and there's some days when we are more living in that intuitive eating world, if you will, that normal quote unquote eating world. I mean, there is no what is the definition of normal? Like, right? Like for all of us, it's different. And you, the beauty of this is you get to discover and, and recreate your relationship with food or with your body or with, you know, exercise. It's not the relationship that was modeled for you by your mom or your dad or someone else. It's not the relationship that diet culture tells you you should have. And so, you know, it's, it's really in a way it takes time to develop safety in any relationship and trust. And we can think about that's what's happening in our relationship with ourselves Mm -hmm. as we're in recovery. I'm not going to trust myself right away because I've been struggling for years. And like the thing beneath the thing is that I don't like myself. I don't think I'm worthy. I don't, you know, there's, there's a variety of things that are beneath the thing. And so I don't want to say we never use meal plans. We do, or we use like aspects of structure in that way. But over time, we need to start to challenge ourselves to, as you said, expand beyond them and learn that, oh, wow, like, okay, so yesterday, you know, it was a really long work day. And maybe I didn't really get to sit down to a true lunch. And, you know, I didn't really have a snack like I I probably needed, right? So let me reflect on that. And, and so I ate more last night. Okay, so like, I don't need to then turn that into, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible person. How could I do this? I messed up my whole recovery, right? Like we have the tendency because we get dysregulated then all those all those emotions come up for us and yeah. thoughts. But instead, when we're more regulated, when we have more of a sense of, safety in this expanded container of recovery to say, okay, so what did I learn from yesterday? Mm -hmm. You know, I need to make sure I have more snacks on hand at work. I need to be checking in more often. Mm -hmm. You know, if I get hyper-focused on projects, do I set an alarm Mm -hmm. and say, okay, after two hours, I need to check in. I need to eat something. There's a variety of ways, you know, and we, and that requires us to really spend some time reflecting, spend some time looking at what are my needs that are not being met right now. And maybe that's the place for me to step in and really offer myself something that isn't about trying to control anything in my life. It's about trying to give myself what it is that I'm worthy of and what it is my body needs to function. And I think to add to start to feel what it feels like to feel little corners or glimmers of safety in your body, whether you're in recovery or, you know, really struggling or struggling with body image, whatever it is. I think it does. It comes back to those those places of maybe it's not that you need control. Maybe it's that you need more safety, more containment, more, you know, belief of enoughness and worthiness in yourself. Yeah. And we don't, it's not something we teach, right? It's not something that you're like, okay, here's how you have safety in your body. Right. Go. Okay. Um, That's not the way this therapy works. It's okay. So we're going to step into this thing and we're going to do this together when you're ready. And we're going to work with the dysregulation. And the more that our bodies sort of pendulate, right, from that like dysregulated state, and then we're able to bring it back to that state of safety, the more that the body begins to trust, oh, wait a minute, I don't always have to live here and live here too. And and this feels really good. And then once I know, have that glimmer of safety, okay, well, how do we connect with that in other ways? Mm-hmm. How do we expand that in other ways and and to step into some more maybe challenges around that in terms of changing and shifting behavior or thought or what have you and being able to process that as well is really important mm-hmm. you know to talk about it not just have sort of a knee jerk reaction to say well that that sucked I'm never doing that again mm-hmm. which that's a way to shut it down and yeah. in a way maybe you're trying you're trying to contain again in what you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in doing so, you, you know, we're not allowing ourselves to grow into what it is we need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So an invitation to get curious about, you know, when the thought pops up for, for clients, for therapists, clinicians, whoever it is, when the thought pops up of like, this is all about control. I think the invitation is to get really curious about what the control might be the umbrella for. For sure. What is this the umbrella for? And is it really, is this really what I think it is? I think often we, in order to survive, 
We tell ourselves stories. We develop narratives that give us a sense of that which we find safe and secure. And we're, this is really about shifting that narrative. And you're right, curiosity, leaning in, a lot of safety built in and around it. But again, that safety not coming from the old habits and ways of being and doing, the safety then becomes about building safety with our providers, our relationships, and then within ourselves. Yeah. Anything else you feel like you'd like to add? I would say if you're, you know, I want folks to to honor where they're at on that journey, right? If you're still working with a meal plan, there's no need to feel shameful about that. But if you're working with someone who isn't necessarily offering any other conduit out of that, maybe to ask about that with your provider. Like, listen, is this going to be a forever thing or is there more here, you know? and or finding a provider who might be able to offer those types of ways of learning how to heal our relationship with our bodies without having to have these rigid structures in place to do so. Well, thank you so much for indulging me in this conversation. No, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank well, you. I appreciate it. And let us know if anything comes up, you know, as you listen or watch, however you're, you know, tuning in. Let us know what comes up and we're happy to, to follow up, whatever you need. But in the meantime, we will be back next week for another episode. So until then, take care.